All right, welcome back to the DAC Pavilion, everybody. <clears throat> so our first tech talk this morning in the pavilion will be by Aki Fujimura, the chairman and CEO of D2S Incorporated, the managing company sponsor of the eBeam Initiative, and a member of the Center for Deep Learning and Electronics Manufacturing. Aki has been involved with several EDA companies, both large and small, throughout his career, and he currently serves on the governing council of the ESDA. It is my pleasure to introduce my fellow MIT alumnus, Aki Fujimura, to answer the question for us today, is curvy design an opportunity or a dream? Aki. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Uh, where do I stand? I guess over here is good. So uh, I'm from D2S, and D2S, can you hear me? It's okay. Uh, D2S uh, does GPU acceleration for the semiconductor manufacturing industry. Okay, so um, D2S is actually a spin out from Cadence where I was CTO of an incubation or four incubation units. One of those spun out as D2S, D2S and that's how we came to be 16 years ago. So I've been out of design for quite a while, focused on manufacturing and using GPU acceleration to help various machines and also data flow to uh, handle uh, all this complex stuff that you have to simulate in a manufacturing cycle. Uh, but before that, I was in design for a long, long time. And in fact, I started in design in 1979. I had this very fortunate uh, experience being a co-op student at Honeywell, uh, being assigned a design automation uh, back then it wasn't called EDA, right? Back then it was the Design Automation Conference, Design Automation to differentiate from CAD. And um, uh, I got to work on an AI-based uh, routing project um, as a sophomore in college. You know? <laughs> like kind of looking back at it, an amazing opportunity. And uh, uh, I got hooked um, by uh, this incredible industry and that's uh, what I've been doing ever since. Um, Design automation is differentiated back then from CAD by automation, right? So tedious and error prone processes being automated was the goal of design automation. And you saw in the uh, pre uh, previous uh, presentation, um, you know, PCB, which was the predominant thing way back then, uh, is still a pretty big market today, right? Um, but it's been taken over by what back then we called VLSI to distinguish from just LSI, very large scale integration. And, and now it's way, way bigger, right? Um, so um, how much way, way bigger it is now is, uh, is the first slide that I want to present. Um, so back when we were working, uh, when I was just starting out, um, that's when it just happened that fully synchronous design, over the cell routing, all these things came to be, and place and route became a market. Um, uh, uh, logic synthesis became a market. Verilog and VHDL, which was uh, the opposing thing. Um, simulation, logic simulation became a market. Right? Before that, in the 1970s, is when SPICE was done. And so other kinds of simulation were already happening, but fully synchronous design with standard cells or gate array methodology was really happening in the middle of 1980s. And at the same time as being fully synchronous, Manhattan assumption happened right at that time. Okay, so a um, lot of things, you know, incredible amounts of progress has been made in all different fronts in design automation EDA ever since then. But the fundamental underlying scheme of how automation, different components automate different things in what sequence, that's kind of been the same since then. Back in 1985, the fastest computer available was the Cray 2. It was 1.9 gigaflops, floating uh, point operations per second, for $15 million. That was the best thing you can get, and none of the EDA tools could use it, except some really leading edge people did use it for critical net simulation of SPICE. Right, so you had to borrow time on you know, these machines and you could do that. So some people did that, but EDA industry, well, DA industry at the time, um, didn't use it at all. Today, 
my son, my 11-year-old son, has a gaming workstation that actually has a 39 Ti in it, and you can buy that for $2,000, 15 teraflops, right? So the amount of computing that you can do on one little thing, as opposed to one big thing, is 8,000 times what it was when this fully synchronous design methodology was invented. It's 60 million times price performance, right? Usually in business uh, circles, you say an order of magnitude difference in anything is a discontinuity. Two orders of magnitude difference is a major discontinuity. Six orders of magnitude difference, almost seven, by you know, two years from now it'll be seven. And it's a huge discontinuity. There is an opportunity there somewhere, right? The title is, is it a opportunity or a dream? I say it's both. It's opportunity and my personal dream to be able to do something different because of this, this, this difference now. And my thesis today in this talk is its curvy design. In another world of gaming, a similar thing has happened, and this can serve as an inspiration somewhat. The left side is the most popular, by an order of magnitude, most popular game, a video game in the world. It's Minecraft, right? It's most popular because it's a great concept and it's a great game. Well, that, that's the number one thing. But number two thing is they were very careful to try to design it so that it can run on any platform. It can run on PCs, it can run on phones before they were smartphones, right? And it, it can run on any platform. To contrast, on the right side is Death Stranding. It is not a very popular game, actually, but it's an award-winning game for its graphics, right? The, you know, I mean, look at the rendering, it's amazing. The only way you can do the picture on the right is if you design the game to begin with to only run on GPUs. Right? If you try to run it on GPUs and CPUs, you end up with the most popular game, which is on the left. Right? So there's a difference in what you can do if you assume a different kind of a computing mechanism. It's not just that GPU can run it faster. There are GPU versions of uh, Minecraft that have much better graphics. Right? But the underlying thing that you try to implement has to fundamentally be different in how you approach the problem if you want to be able to take advantage of a huge discontinuity like SIMD, uh, single instruction multiple data computing. So I just want to uh, give you a little background about uh, where I was before we started D2S uh, 16 years ago. Um, in the 1980s, uh, uh, we were at Tangent. Um, uh, I was one of the five founders. And uh, uh, we created first the picture on the left, which is a rows and channels based one or two layer metal placer route system for, this. in this case, a Tancel was a standard cell system. And then we invented Tangate, which became Gate Ensemble on the Cadence and became Cell 3 Ensemble for the standard cell version, um, which is the picture on the right, where we took advantage of over the cell routing. Right? Back in those days, if you could have one layer of metal, that was pretty good. And if you could have two layers of metal, that was advanced. And we knew that three layers of metal was coming up next. Right? We knew that, so we said, okay, it's an opportunity to do over the cell routing. But we knew exactly that all of routing was going to be Manhattan, meaning it was going to be up and down in one layer, left and right in another layer, right? HVH, you know, we call it, right? And, and uh, that assumption was built in for the first time in the Tangate system. I'm actually the original designer of Def and Left uh, format. And when we designed it, we said, well, it's kind of stupid to repeat the same coordinate, you know, half of the coordinate uh, every time. X is the same in one direction, Y is the same in the other direction. So let's eliminate that. Now, of course, Oasis and everybody else does it too. But we were the original people to do that. ECO, engineering change, was another thing that we created. Right? We made everything, all the tools, including 
depth and left re-entrant so that you can make a small change in the design without redoing the whole design. Right? These were all important concepts that we created. Um, you also timing assurance, right? Uh, because it was fully synchronous, if you do timing analysis, you can do timing assurance automatically, or test synthesis, right? All these concepts were pretty much invented at IBM and announced at the Design Automation Conference of back then. Um, but uh, we were the first to commercialize that, right? And then, uh, uh, out in 1998, uh, uh, by the way, one of the founders of, uh, the other founders of Tangent was Steve Tai, who's giving a keynote speech on Wednesday morning. And so you should go take a look at that. He's doing an a AI chip uh, startup uh, called Perceive, and it should be a very interesting talk. Um, uh, he and I came back together again uh, at Simplex, and uh, uh, we worked on the X architecture, which uses metal metal four and metal five as diagonal layers. And this, why it had to be 45 degree diagonal to be useful is a subject of what's gonna come up next. I'm too close to the mic. Um, one thing that I think is important to note here on this picture is if you look at the yellow one, it's not just that there are diagonal layers. The yellow wires are going all over the place in one layer, right? It's not, it's not unidirectional, it's omnidirectional. Of course, you know, with lithography uh, considerations, which I know a lot about, um, uh, uh, you know, you, the one layer is more optimal than the other layers, but you can route in the other layers, and there is a lot of uh, uh, things that are improved by being able to do that, and that's part of what I want to talk about. So this is only 45 degrees. What I'm talking about today is an extension of that, which is curved linear, which now is uniquely enabled. On the right is a picture of what D2S does today. Remember, we're in the manufacturing space, not in the design space. And in the manufacturing space, we design mask shapes, not wafer shapes, but in order to make the wafer shapes great, we design mask shapes. And mask shapes get manipulated like that. And we create, this is actually a production tool, um, where we create a curvilinear shape like that. And I'll talk about that more in the upcoming slides. So, um, oh yeah, I forgot to say. Right? The, 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 so the important thing about this slide, I forgot, um, is um, I, I just want you to know that I'm not coming from the manufacturing side totally naive of design considerations. Right? You know, I, I, I was there before. So I know kind of now both the manufacturing side and the design side. And what I'm seeing is a unique convergence of interests where we can do both manufacturing and design much better by doing curvilinear design or manufacturable design. So um, I, you probably all know this. Uh, sorry for being pedantic. Oh, uh, I see a lot of cameras up. But these slides will be available. Uh, on design to silicon.com? Yeah, design to silicon.com, design to the number two, silicon.com, um, very soon. Today? Or so? Yeah, very soon. So um, I, 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 you, can, uh, you don't have to take the pictures. Um, so this is a, a picture of how uh, manufacturing works. Right? There's a lithography machine, uh, ASML, Canon, or Nikon are the three manufacturers in the old stage. Up until five years ago, this was the picture. You make a wafer by exposing a photo mask and going through a series of lenses, exposing the wafer that's at the bottom. Okay? And uh, the most leading edge version up until five years ago was 193 nanometer of light immersed in water to improve the numerical aperture. And a resolution of a lithography machine is lambda over NA, or uh, wavelength divided by numerical aperture. So 193 divided by 1.35 is the resolution, uh, is what determines the resolution of a uh, lithography machine, the leading edge lithography machine five years ago. The photo mask that gets inserted is generated by E beam, right? Um, uh, masks are. Uh, very, very precise things. And in fact, they are 4x dimensions of the wafer, but despite that they are 4x dimensions of the wafer, you have to build them really carefully. Why? Because you build many, many, uh, you know, millions, hundred millions, sometimes even a billion chips from one mask, 
right? So if you have any defect, any kind of an aberration on the mask, it shows up on every version of the wafer. So it's really important to get the mask right, okay? So they do that uh, uh, as reflected in the amount of time you take to write a mask. Wafer machines, they have to be efficient. So 100 wafers per hour, 200 wafers per hour, 240 wafers per hour, these are the numbers that you actually have in production machines for writing wafers. For writing a mask, the units are flipped. It's an inverse, right? You measure in how many hours it takes to write one mask. And usually something like less than 12 is considered very good. 24 is okay, 48 is occasionally acceptable, anything more than 48 is just like not practically possible, right? So units are flipped and you take a long time to get the mask right, so all the wafers are correct, okay? So uh, it's really, uh, uh, you know, uh, when I transitioned into the manufacturing side, it took me a whole year to remember that masks are different from wafers. You know, this is a really, really important thing, but it's sometimes confusing. On a mask, making side, it's written by E-Beam, and this is up until five years ago now. Uh, up until five years ago, the leading edge mask writers were variable shape beam machines, where you take the electron gun, and then you take the first aperture, which is a square aperture, and create a square shape, and then you create a uh, you, you have an a, a electromagnetic deflection system in here, which deflects the beam to any point on the second aperture, which is also rectangular or sometimes 45 degree triangles, and the intersection of the two shapes creates the, any arbitrary rectangle up to a maximum size, okay? And uh, that only creates one shot, one rectangle, right? Well, the entire mask is written by a succession of 100 picoseconds each, um, you know, the projections of these things. So you have a whole bunch of these things being written, and that's why it takes 12, 24, 48 hours to write a complex mask. So that's how it was. But since five years ago, things have changed drastically on both fronts. Now we have EUV, extreme ultraviolet, uh, uh, source of light. Uh, this is uh, only made by ASML and 13.5 uh, nanometer wavelength of light, but numerical aperture is lower, so it's 13.5 uh, uh, divided by 0.33 is the rough, you know, the, it, it's what scales with the resolution of what you can write. And so if you compare um, uh, uh, 193 divided by 1.35, and divide that uh, by 13.5 over 0.33, you get that EUV is roughly 3.5 times higher resolution than 193i, which is incredible, right? Which is really great, but it's not the 193 divided by 13.5 or 13, it's not like that, right? So um, you do get much better resolution, and we are taking advantage of that. This is a technology that the manufacturing segment's been working on for over 20 years. And finally, in the last five years, now some of you probably have cell phones that already have EUV built layers in it. Um, EUV is a very strong source of energy, so uh, regular optical lenses don't work. You have to use reflective uh, uh, lenses. So, uh, so you have like, you know, just, just like uh, uh, whatever the satellite-based uh, uh, microscopes look like, and they have reflective-based things, right? And um, masks are also reflective. Masks can't be transmissive, it has to be reflective. And when you have a reflective mask, if you shine the light directly onto it, it bounces right back at the, at, at the light source, right? So you can't project anything, so you can't do it that way. And so because it's reflective, there has to be an incidence of light. Six degree incidence is what they chose, and six degrees coming back. And because there's a angle to it, now all sorts of complex effects, like you know, the masks are actually three-dimensional, so it creates a shadow. It actually shifts the shape, and so on, so on, so on. So, um, so the computation required to adjust for all these effects are really significant in EUV, 
EUV. So not only EUV much more difficult because resolution is higher, so what you have, you know, your accuracy has to be much more. Not only that, there are more complex effects in EUV, so EUV masks are much harder to compute for. At the same time, somewhat coincidentally and somewhat not, um, the mask writing world also completely changed. The mask writing world in the last five years Every leading edge manufacturer in the world now has mass multi-beam based mask writing that's in production use today to write masks every day. Okay, this is in a, you know, a, a very high volume production use. And multi-beam writing, as opposed to variable shape beam or VSB writing, writes in pixels, just like you know, how this screen is displayed or how your phones work, right? It writes in pixels. It's not color, it's grayscale. So um, uh, it's writing with a whole bunch of apertures, 256,000 is the first generation set of machines, uh, uh, set of square apertures that are projected one shot at a time, 256,000 beams at a time, and it tessellates the entire mask plane and creates a mask image using grayscale computing. Right? So as opposed to VSB that's doing one shot at a time, multi-beam shoots a whole bunch of shots at a time. It's not like the TV screen where everything is all at once because there are so many of them, but um, uh, it's, uh, the, the principle behind multi-beam writing is pixelization, rasterization. And what that does is a very important difference that's going to uh, eventually come to curvilinear design. We're still on curvilinear masks. The mask shapes, which are curvilinear like this, would take forever to write on a VSB machine. And I mentioned, you know, 24, 48, any more than that is not practical. Well, it would be any more than that if you tried to write curvilinear shapes like that. Because you have to, because, you know, the, the zigzags on the corners, right? Um, you know, you, you try to approximate as much as you can, but you still have to write a whole bunch of shots. These are all rectangles that has to be individually, successively uh, uh, projected. Right? So it takes a long time. It's just not practical. Nobody even tries to do this. Right? On a multi-beam mask writer, any shape can be written just as accurately in exactly the same speed. Right? Just as accurately in exactly the same speed. Because it works just like a TV. Right? Your TV screen doesn't take longer to paint when you have a more complex shape. Right? It's exactly the same principle. It works on the principle of rasterization. And that's really important because this uniquely enables curvilinear shapes. I mentioned that in the previous generation VSB writers, you have rectangular apertures, but you also have 45 degree triangular apertures. And because of that, 45 degrees was possible to write on a mask before. That's why the X architecture in the late 1990s was possible. Any other angle? was not possible, right? Now, these are mask shapes, not design shapes, right? But if you can't put it on the mask, you can't have it on the wafer either. So in order to be able to put something on the wafer that is any shape, any angle, practically speaking, you have to be able to do that on the mask, and that's what multi-beam writers do. And today, Every single leading edge manufacturer has multi-beam machines as practically the only thing they use to project the leading edge masks. Okay? This has already happened. This is not something I'm projecting to happen in the future. This is already true today in manufacturing. So what that gives rise to, right? I remember, you know, I said that like, you know, I used to be confused by mask and design. And, uh, you know, this is a mask shape, not a, a wafer shape. The wafer shape that you want, let's say, I'm, I'm conjecturing, wafer shape you want is three parallel lines like that. In order to create the wafer shape like that, the mask shapes today wants to be like this. You can kind of see the three parallel lines, right? 
you know? But there's a whole bunch of stuff outside of that. And I'm going to talk about this in a second, why you need that, right? But this is important to remember, right? What we do today, this is already a production system that D2S has. We create, we design the mask shapes that are curved linear like that. And because we have multi-beam machines in all the leading edge fabs, they can print those masks today. So for something completely different, and I'm going to talk about golf, OK? Uh, and then you see the connection in a second. Uh, so um, the mo the one of the most difficult um, uh, holes in the entire PGA, you know, Professional Golfers and Association Tour, is the seventh hole on Pebble Beach, you know, not too far from here, OK? And it's only 107 yards, OK? Uh, professionals, these professionals, if it, they were in a practice range and if they had no wind, they can hit 107 yard pins within three or four yards, right? It, three, three sigma, it, it, three, three or four yards, no problem. But in reality, in an actual tournament where it really counts, where they want to do the best they can, the dispersion looked like that in 2016, right? Why is that? It's because of wind. But it's not just any wind. It's changing wind, right? If the wind is coming from right to left, and it's 10 yards, and if you knew that, you just aim right, right? You bias your solution. You change the process center to aim right. And it's going to move, and it's going to go there every time. It's fine, no problem, right? But the problem is wind is different every time. And you can't cut the wind either because of the way the, 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 way the hole is designed. And it's actually shooting from this side that way. So there's a bunker on front. So you can't roll it. So you can't cheat the wind and keep it low. So you have to hit a high ball to get it to stop because otherwise it's going to roll and go into the other side. So um, you have to hit a high shot. And all high shots are subject to wind. And wind in Pebble Beach, as you can kind of see, is very, very strong and varying. Strong isn't the problem. Varying is the problem. Okay? This is a, a lesson that I learned when I went into manufacturing 16 years ago. In, manufa in, you know, in design, you do process corners, and, right? I mean, you know, process corners are you know, it's like 100 or 200 you have to worry about now. It's getting more complex, yes. So you do have to worry about it, but not like you have to worry about any manufacturing. In manufacturing, it's not about the nominal. It's about the variation. You're trying to reduce the variation. That's what you're trying to do in manufacturing, right? If it's just a nominal shift, you bias it. You just, you know, you just aim right. It, no problem. It's the variation. It's the changing wind that causes a dispersion like that. That is the problem in manufacturing, right? That's the problem we're trying to solve with software for manufacturing like what we do. And that's why you need these shapes. That's why you need these curvilinear shapes. So this is a study that Micron did um, a couple, three years ago, maybe, um, uh, where you're contrasting the old style machines, uh, old style OPC, or optical proximity correction, up above, and the new style IoT, inverse lithography technology, which, which we provide um, uh, in the bottom. The, Resilience to manufacturing variation, right? Resilience to wind. Resilience to manufacturing variation is what's reflected in these rectangles. Bigger rectangles are better, right? Bigger rectangles mean that even though there is more variation, you can still shoot the target, right? So um, you can see that in their study, they're saying there was almost a 2x improvement in resilience to manufacturing variation by going from the VSB-based world up, the, up at the top to multi-beam-based world down at the bottom with curvilinear design. This is why curvilinear mask shapes are now demanded by everyone. E-beam initiative, uh, which is an industry body um, that we sponsor, uh, uh, they do a survey, a luminary survey every year, and the industry luminaries are saying overwhelmingly 
that whether it's 193i or EUV, now that we have multi beams and you can, because it's so much better for the wafer, mask shapes are going to be curvilinear. Okay? So mask shapes are going to be curvilinear. And, and these are uh, electron micrograph uh, pictures of you know, real masks that's been uh, taken by Micron. So mask shapes are now curvilinear. Now, this, um, this is different from the wafer shapes being curvilinear, but I'll make the connection in a second. Right? There are two things that you should take away from the fact that mask shapes are curvilinear. One is that mask shapes being curvilinear enables design shapes to be curvilinear. The other one is uniquely, right? No, not, not possible before, but now it's possible. The other one is that mask shapes being curvilinear means the data path in the mask shop has to be able to handle curvilinear shapes fine. Right? They have to be able to do it in practical time. They have all the same limitations, if not worse, um, of the design people in having to deal with the data path. Right? The mask shops today are able to handle curvilinear things. And that should be existence proof that curvilinear processing is something that is possible to do. And I'm just going to give you two different examples. One is MRC and the other is MPC. First, the MRC, which is mask rule checking, which is similar to design rule checking, but applied to the mask world, right? Um, if you want to check design rule against something like this, um, like, you know, how, how would you do that? Um, it, it becomes a question. And today, mask rule, rule decks are just like design rule decks where there's like, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lines that's trying to deal with the fact that what you're trying to manufacture is actually not manufacturable. 90 degree corners are not possible to manufacture. If you try to make a rectangle like the one before, they're going to turn out to be curvilinear, right? What's actually on the wafer will be curvilinear. So um, when you're trying to do a diagonally opposite uh, rectangles, you know that you can get them a little bit closer because they're not going to go out all the way to the corner anyway. Right? So you have all these design rules that saying, OK, if you have a diagonally opposing corner, you can get a little bit closer. Right? Same thing happens in a mask world, too. Right? But you don't have to do this anymore if you have curvilinear shapes that are manufacturable. Because all the shapes that you're describing, asking to be manufactured, are actually manufacturable. You can do a simple thing like this to do design rule checking. Right? This is conceptual, not an actual CAD algorithm. And you take a ball of a certain diameter, and then you roll it inside. And if it rolls completely inside without touching any of the boundaries, if you don't go, if you don't go out, then you're clean. And if you, on the other hand, roll it and you run into the corner up there and it sticks out, then that's a design rule violation, right? Because the curvature is too steep. Okay? Same thing happens um, on the outside. Right? The diameter might be different on the outside than the inside, but you know, when it runs into another, another feature, that's a design rule violation or mask rule violation. But it, that's all you need. You, you don't need anything else. That's all you need. Right? And that, um, that simplification, it seems like it's going to be more complex, right? You know? Especially if you're thinking in a polygon world, you have so many vertices, oh my gosh, the computational complexity. But the, the task itself gets simpler. Similar thing in the world of uh, MPC, mask process correction. This is like biasing and all the, all the other constructive algorithms that you use uh, 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 you know, DRC tools to, to do. And this is an example from Nuclear um, where uh, you're trying to print something like this on a mask. And then if you don't do anything, you end up with something like this, where the lines are too thin and the spacing, the opening is too big. Right? If you do a correction, dose-based, pixel-based correction of every pixel for linearity and for, uh, for edge enhancement, um, you can create a picture like that. PLDC happens to be pixel-level dose correction. That's a feature on the new flare mask rider that D2S provides. So um, we, can, we can do this 
in real time for mask operations without adding any time to the throughput of the mask shot. That we can do that is proof that curvilinear designs do not have to be a limitation in the design world either. Right? We're just using computers, you know, just the same as you. So um, manufacturing is already there. Right? The transformation of the mask world to being curvilinear also means that the design world is, can be curvilinear too. When we did the X architecture, we could only do 45 degree routing. That's the only thing we could practically add. Today, we're not limited to 45 degrees. You can do any angle and you can do any curvilinear shape and it would take the same amount of time to manufacture with exactly the same accuracy. Now, when I talk about curvilinear designs, though, I don't mean like that red shape for the mask. That's for the mask, right? For design, I'm mostly talking about inter and intra connect um, inside the cell or outside the cell uh, connect. So it's mostly curvilinear routing, right? Uh, it could be inter connect or intra connect, but still curvilinear routing. That's what I'm mostly talking about. Just want to make an analogy, right? Um, if you want to pump uh, pump water from down at the bottom of the hill to a house on the top of the hill, then uh, you might pipe it like that, but everybody knows intuitively that's probably not the smartest thing to do, right? You might want something like that, or actually even better is to make a direct connection, right? Sure, this, <laughs> sure this line is a direct line. So, um, so uh, uh, the similar thing I think is possible in the routing world too, right? Um, you can't help the vias going up, but you can help the number of vias that you have to have. If you reduce the number of vias, you reduce that, and if you, try, if you allow omnidirectional routing, then you can do what's on the right. So, um, curvy design is manufacturing aware design. That's the most important message that I want to give you coming from the manufacturing side. And the insight is this. Manufacturable shapes are more reliably manufacturable. Okay? If you give manufacturing a target that is actually manufacturable, a 90 degree corners or not, right? even 45 degree corners or not, 125 or whatever, you know, they're not, they're not manufacturable. You can't make a sharp turn in reality, in, in nature, right? If you give, design, give, give manufacturers a manufacturable target, it will come out more the same every time. Variation, manufacturing variation will be less if you give them more manufacturable shapes. And non curvilinear designs are not manufacturable. Right? This is the most important thing. So, um, knowing uh, what will be manufactured, on the other hand, on the design side, also makes the task easier because you don't have to guess anymore. Um, you know, if I try to manufacture this, it's going to actually turn into this. So, therefore, I'm going to allow for that. Uh, that could be in DRC, that could be in parasitic extraction, right? All over the place, you have these guesses that you're making in a design cycle. And I submit to you a part of the reason why you have process corners so wide is because of that, because you're guessing, right? You know, if you can just give manufacturing shapes that can actually be manufactured, corners will shrink. I want to talk about via reduction. I talked about it a little bit, right? Uh, vias have to be this way, and it's better if you don't have them. Um, this is uh, Taipei 101, right? If you go to any high-rise building in the world, right, the first floor is occupied by security and elevator shafts. You don't even have any space for any, like, any stores or anything, right? Because all you got is space to have elevator shafts that go up to the 50th floor, 25th floor, 100th floor, and so on, right? So um, same kind of thing actually happens in semiconductors too, 
right? But for very, very few things that's coming in from the top, everything is going from a transistor to a transistor. So it's got to go up and it's got to come down, right? And every layer, you're limited by ideas as obstructions. Everything that goes up above is going to have to obstruct your layer, right? So um, eliminating ideas is a really, really important thing to do. And what I'm suggesting is that by doing omnidirectional routing, by not making the Manhattan assumption that one layer can only go this way, and therefore any connection like this has to go up, right? That assumption should be questioned. So when I talk about this in the manufacturing uh, circles, um, it's a very popular notion. Manufacturers would love like Micron, would love to have designers specify manufacturable designs. Don't give me 90 degree, this two successive 90 degree jogs. I can't do that, right? I, I just can't do that. It's gonna turn out like this, right? So give me manufacturable designs. So they say that, but then they say, but it's impossible to convince the design people because the entire design chain, entire ecosystem of design tools or making a Manhattan assumption, Manhattan assumptions. So it's everything has to change. So it's impossible to make this change. Well, it's not everything. It's a lot, but it's not everything, right? Spice doesn't have to change, right? Any of the rigorous simulators, they don't have to change, right? So um, what has to change? Well, I say in the beginning, all you gotta change is no, all you gotta change is these four things, right? You have to do DRC and plastic extraction in either the custom path or the uh, place and route path or automated path. But on custom design, um, you know, custom design systems can do any shapes today, right? For um, photonics or whatever, but they're not very efficient at it, right? So they probably can use uh, some improvement there and routing. Uh, you know, you can do small jogs and create unmanufacturable shapes, but um, uh, you can't do omnidirectional routing today automatically, right? I, I think the first thing that's going to happen is to create uh, uh, curvilinear shapes like this on the custom design side, because custom design is always like um, easier to do uh, handcrafted stuff like that, right? Um, and then probably the first thing that's gonna happen in routing is like the picture, uh, this is from Micron, they actually do this in production, they don't do it automatically, um, but they would love it if there was an automatic tool that can jog like this, because if you have to jog a 128-bit bus, and if you have to do it with, uh, with uh, 90 degree corners, it takes too much real estate to jog it, right? And even 45 degree routing takes space. Best is if you can do it, take space. And it's, um, uh, it's got manufacturing problems mm -hmm. like uh, this one is showing a, a bridging that happens uh, because of what they try to do. This is an actual case, uh, right? Um, um, uh, if we could create an automatic tool that can jog like this, that would be a great start, I think. Now, of course, anytime you do any of that, Parasitic extraction has to uh, come into play and you have to be able to handle curvilinear shapes. No easy task. But at least in a detailed design, like for custom designs, you can do it because, uh, you know, like FastCap can do this. Uh, this is actually a FastCap output and can do it today. Um, um, DRC, I already talked about, right? Uh, it's just like MRC. I think the task that DRC is asked to check for becomes easier in this world because you can specify only curvilinear shapes that are manufacturable shapes. So you don't have to do all these hacks to check for manufacturability. So um, what I'm imagining, what I'm hoping for is, you know, I know there's like uh, maybe 10,000 people that do software development for this industry, right? And, you know, probably only like 200 of you are interested in doing something different, right? But I'm sure there are 200 of you that are interested in doing something different. And I'm hoping to inspire at least some of you in industry or academia to do some research in this area because it's possible now, right? Remember, five years ago, it was only a dream and not possible, right? Not just practically possible, just not possible, right? Today, it is entirely possible. Right? So this is something that changed. We can do this now. 
right? Well, what's the benefit of that is part of what probably uh, has to be studied, right? But how do you do it, right? How do you route um, uh, without the Manhattan assumption? How can we make an algorithm that works like that? How can we do custom layout uh, for curvy designs or uh, doing DRC for curvy designs or capacity, uh, capacitance extraction at the full chip scale um, for something like that? Um, reducing power or uh, you know, power performance and area and yield through manufacturability. Those are all things that I think curved linear is going to do, curved linear design is going to do, but how much, right? You know, is, is it worth the trouble? You know, is there enough gain? These are all areas I think that are very, very ripe for research and papers, and it would be great um, if we could um, have a session in 2025. I'm not saying 23 or 24. We can probably have like one or two papers. In fact, um, IMEC, uh, a, a very famous research institute in Belgium, they've already done some papers on curved linear design. So the thought is starting to happen already, right? But, you know, can we make it a real study to transform the physical design world to something that's really just totally different from what you were used to seeing? You know, can we make it so that curved linear designs get manufactured very close to what was designed, and therefore the design side benefits from being able to create a design that knows what's gonna get manufactured, and then manufacturing side gets to benefit from being able to manufacture, having a target that's actually doable, and being able to do it more reliably, and because it's being done more reliably, the design side is able to have a smaller process window. Right? Can we do that? Right? That's, the, that's the dream, and that, I think, is also the opportunity of, uh, of what's, uh, what's ahead in the design community. Okay? Um, thank you. Okay, any questions? Yes, Dave. Oh, so the question, question is, uh, uh, can't you just have a uh, Manhattan design that gets transformed into a curved linear design so the design can happen in the Manhattan space like you know, with existing tools, but the actual thing becomes a curved linear design that the uh, manufacturers target, right? I, I think that's entirely possible. Um, in fact, I, I, you know, I would think that TSMC could do this themselves, right? Um, yeah, I, I think that would be a good idea, actually. Does data volume become an issue? Data volume concern is definitely one of the big ones. And uh, the difference uh, in what we do in manufacturing, right, what D2S does for the manufacturing world and this world is that we process everything in pixels. We work in a rasterized world. Right? In the rasterized world, and as you know, you know in, in math, um, the pixel domain and the polygon domain are mathematical duals as long as you don't exceed a certain limit on resolution. But the limit on resolution is known because the multi-beam writer is writing with certain size pixels, so you can't possibly do anything better than that. Right? So we know what the limit is. So given that, we can do entire processing in a pixel space, and that's what we do. And in a pixel space, there's no difference in compute time, no difference in accuracy. To contrast, the world of design, which is mostly polygon-based, right? Um, yeah, sure, the number of vertices that increase is going to increase the computational complexity, so that is definitely an issue. But if you're doing deep learning, for example, you're rasterizing already. Right? Uh, you know, pretty much nobody does deep learning of image-based physical design computing um, uh, in, a, uh, in a vector world, right? You know, everybody's doing it, converting it to pixels first, and then converting it back, silly enough, I think. But anyway, converting it back, right? Um, those kinds of things, I think, will, uh, 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 you know, create uh, insights uh, in people's minds about how to be able to do these kinds of things without the explosion in data volume or runtime. Sorry? What is that process? Uh, what is that process? How many times? 
Oh, uh, uh, this particular one, it was a seven track design, so it's old. It was just using it as an example. But th this, um, uh, today, the leading edge is three nanometers, right? And then it's going to be two nanometers soon and one point something, and then they're, they're going to start counting in angstroms. Um, uh, you know, that, uh, this technology applies equally to anything. It's independent of technology now. Ah, very good question, right? In order for uh, ASIC designer or foundry, uh, in foundry to allow it, they have to get comfortable. This is where, where you know, Dave's insight might come into play, right? Um, but uh, uh, Dan Ping Pang, uh, who is in charge of IoT at TSMC, he's already made public statements saying, I think curved linear designs are a good idea. So there's ideas already being seeded Right? It's not something that they would, you know, if you went to them and said, I want to do curve linear design, they'll say, are you crazy? Right? You know, but um, is it something that is going to be possible? I think there are actually seeds that are being sowed already. I, so, uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, I think there was some earlier work um, that you did with VSB to take advantage of the natural blurriness of 193 lithography um, to actually reduce the shot count to do sort of moderately curved oh, designs. Yeah. Have you shifted now to actually focus really on the multi-beam side of things? And with that, do you see the sort of likely um, users being more those processing EUV layers rather than any of the upper 193 type layers? Well, that's incredible that somebody in this audience knows that. So thank you for remembering that. That's what we, we still do that yeah. uh, today for VSB. Um, but uh, the world has since shifted to having the leading edge mask writing be entirely multi-beam based. Yeah. I mean, it's 100% multi-beam based. So the leading edge, right? You know, by number of machines, VSP far, it's like 98% maybe VSP, yeah. right? But the leading edge is all written by multi-beam. So uh, because of that, the relevance of that technology is reduced. That's sorry? Mass cost, cost will be down based on uh, to do curved linear things. I don't think it's going to be down, right? Uh, you know, if they have an opportunity to make more money, they're going to make money. Um, you know, and you know, TSMC is a whole different thing, right? You know, <laughs> that's how they get their NRE. So. Yeah, hey, Ricky, uh, great talk, inspiring talk. So you mentioned um, silicon photonics earlier. On the sorry. You mentioned the silicon photonics. It's already photonics, yeah, yeah. on the design side. There are a few examples that are already using curvilinear, right? Silicon photonics Absolutely, is one of them. Yeah. Complexity is not there yet, yeah. but the shape is there. The info design with any angle is still not a curvilinear. Yeah. It's any angle, so it's approximating it. Yeah. Flat panel design is already curvy, yeah. right? So on the design side, there are a few of those trends. Yes. Yes. How do they get to the SOC complexity? I guess that's further research is needed. So my question for you uh, is the uh, four, earlier slide you mentioned the four uh, enabling technologies, right? Yes. Cur customer design, yeah. uh, routing, uh, yes, parasitic extraction DRC. You have already solved the DRC issue, right? The, the M, what is that? MRC. MRC, it, yeah. right? It's, are you, what, what, are you writing your own caliber Rudex to do this boss rolling around? What kind of things are you doing, are you using today to do the MRC? Yeah, so the ball rolling around, <laughs> that's a conceptual explanation. Right, okay. That's not what the algorithm actually does. Right, right. But it's basically checking curvature everywhere. Right? And it's only checking curvature. Right? Right. If you can meet the curvature requirement, mm -hmm. then you actually, by default, meet the minimum spacing requirement. Right. Okay, thank <laughs> so, you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'm sorry, yeah. Oh, so. Yeah, so the question is, uh, uh, is anybody doing this already, right? And the picture up there is from Micron, and so they do this, 
right? They kind of have their memory maker. So, oh, no, 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 they're, they're, they're doing this. They're, they're doing this. Yeah, they're doing this. And, and the reason is because in the memory design, uh, uh, because you, you, know, you do billions of parts, right? It's worth it to spend the extra time, right? They have to do it by hand, so it's a lot of effort. Right? And you can see in this picture, they actually tried it and came up with a problem. So of course they fixed it, but it took extra time to do that, right? So it's a lot of work, you know? But, but for them, it's so worth it that they do this, right? If we imagine if you could do this automatically, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There are some other um, off angle cases, right? An X architecture chip actually was, you know, there were 10 chips that actually got produced in production, right? Um, or the, which company? Oh, D2S is focused on manufacturing. What we do is GPU acceleration for the semiconductor manufacturing industry. And what we're saying, just because I have a design background before that, right? You know, seeing in the manufacturing world very intimately that this is now possible makes me think, you, you know, on the design side, we should be working on this stuff. I, I hope Cadence, Synopsis, Siemens, you know, Ansys, I hope, yeah. Well, this is for papers, right? You know, usually what happens is people publish papers and then they go quiet because they're actually trying to do it for real and they don't want to help the competitors anymore, right? <laughs> Probably, I, that's my guess, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I think research-wise, this is not that difficult, right? Especially in the era of GPU-accelerated and deep learning-based systems, I, I think this is really actually not that difficult. But to make a production system is a whole different game, as, as you all know. Right? No. I, I think so. More manufacturable design, right? I do think that power, performance, area, manufacturability, yield, I think all of those things without trade offs, they will all improve. I, I think. Yeah, the, the, the question is, um, uh, uh, does self-placement make a difference in manufacturing? The truth is, today, it already does. It's IoT or OPC's job to compensate for that, right? Um, when you place a standard cell, two or three standard cell rows apart affect how that standard cell is going to print, right? But what IoT or OPC does is to look at what's, what's around you and compensate the design itself so that it, they, all instances of it, regardless of the neighbor, comes out as much the same as possible. But they still don't come out exactly the same, of course. Right? That, that aspect is improved by making a curve linear target. So uh, yeah, even that aspect of it will be better. No, it's not just because of design rules. Um, it's because more manufacturable shapes are more reliably manufacturable, I said, right? But it's also more reliably computable. If, if you have a target that you can achieve, you're going to get it better. If you have a target that you know you can't achieve, but you have to approximate, like you know you can't get 90 degree corners, Right? What all OPC and IoT tools do is first transform it into a rough curve linear shape. But they don't know exactly what's manufacturable and what's not, so they're making a conservative curve linear shape that's based on rule base. It, it, it's just a hack, right? And, you know, so, so all of these things will get better if we can just present manufacturing with manufacturable shapes. Yeah, 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 but part of what I'm saying is that um, kind of co-design, 
right, of um, uh, manufacturing and design can in essence happen by using curvilinear design as the proxy for it. it the, the Manhattan assumptions are just untenable, is my body profession. You, you have a question. Hey, are you only talking about metal uh, curve curves, or are you, or do you see applications even in the transistor level, uh, maybe I/O devices or, or th things like From that? From manufacturability point of view, it can be for anything. But practically speaking, um, transistors are you know thin pets now, and you know gated all around, and you know, that all these features are going to have to be straight. Uh, tr you know, transistors, practically speaking, are going to have to be straight. Now yeah. you can have capacitors that are already circles today, right? Inside the vans, there are circles, um, and so uh, uh, there are special, you know, uh, specific applications where curvilinear shapes, uh, as somebody mentioned, uh, so, so uh, you know, photonics before psi quantum, right? You know, trying to do uh, a quantum computing using photonics, you know, right? All, all these things. There are some specialized things, but those are one percenters, right? You know, 99% are, uh, you know, going through TSMC and trying to get manufactured, and, and those shapes um, are the shapes that I'm talking about. Um, so, benefiting so from being curvilinear. Are, are these fins already curved or they are Manhattan? I mean, the fin fits in. In, in reality, they're already curvilinear. They're already curved. They're yeah. On the wafer, if you took a picture of the wafer, there are no straight lines. Even things that are supposed to be straight, they won't actually be straight, right? That's part of the problem, you know? Um, so, um, but, uh, you know, if you try to draw a 90 degree jog, Right, uh, you know, two 90 degree turns, and it'll be like this. Right, in, in reality, reality is very different. And having to try to account for that possibility is what's giving rise to an incredibly complex DRC, parasitic extraction decks, and all, you know, all this stuff. So, do you see the manufacturers actually giving us a PDK deck that actually can, they can represent the rules this way, because that would be. be. You're right. That was uh, your question too, right? If you ask TSMC, you know, how can I do curved linear design? Uh, they're gonna say no way. I mean, you know, it's like you, know, you don't even have any tools that are certified to be able to do it. That, that you know, they'll, they'll they'll say that, right? On the other hand, like I was saying earlier, there are people inside TSMC in the manufacturing side that are already saying, you know there is merit to this thought, right? So, you know, it's, it's an emerging thing as opposed to something that you can do today. Right, but it's a chicken egg problem if you don't you're right. that, right? Yeah, you're, you're right, there is a chicken and egg problem and part of what I'm trying to do here today um, is to try to, to break that chicken and egg, you know, the catch 22, right? You know, like because um, but right now both sides are going Oh, you can't do it even if I did, right? You can't do it even if I did, you know? And the thing that's different from you know, 40 years in the past is it is possible to manufacture them now, right? So, so the first thing is awareness, I think, right? I think the, if the design community understood that all these years of assumption that everybody's had, which was true, you couldn't manufacture it if you tried it, right? That's not true anymore. We can design, we can design and they can be manufactured today with the same accuracy, with same efficiency, right? So, so you know, yeah, you're right. I, I'm trying to break that tie, but you're right. In reality, that's, that it's there. The, sorry, one point. In the, in the micron case, oh. they had 45. Right? Yeah, in the micron case. Yeah, it, this is more 45, right? So it's a little bit more simpler, but they do, they do, um, they did, they were able to translate into rules for this case. I'm assuming. Uh, uh, yeah, um, they just use uh, a virtual solve, uh, you know, okay. a custom layout tool to do it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah.